its interests become it, the interests of its own people. And it has no chance of surviving because at the end, the people are going to revolt. This happened, for example, in the Roman Empire. What the Quran here is saying is that it's not those who disbelieve that are ganging on you, if that's what you think. It is because you are not strengthening yourself and becoming allies. That is, then you, don't, you won't be able to stop anybody from being corrupt and from uh, mischief or uh, uh, corruption and mischief. So this leads to a different theory, which is, it's called Nazarit al-Tadafur, which means that all civilizations, they do live, they do have interests, but they bump into each other, okay? And that bumping, I can face it with another bump. So it is, I'm trying to get my interests here, I might be faced with the interest of the others of another civilization. It is no longer the understanding that one civilization is conspiring against. It's understanding there are civilizations that all exist at the same time. Each one has its own interest. We need to sit down, we need to talk, and find out. This is what is happening today in the Arab Spring, by the way. And what you've seen in the past two weeks, that was unthinkable. The Muslim political parties in the Arab world, they were kept under. They were kept in prisons for about 50 years. And it was always like, we have to keep them in jail. They'll talk to the US. We have to keep them in jail. If they come out, they're going to destroy democracy. And they will not let anybody else. So, and this went on. They sold this. The dictators and tyranny sold this to, to the states. And this is what happened. Of course, it caused a lot of reactions. And the reactions were, when those people got out of jail, because they were tortured so much, they came out not as human beings. They came out as monsters and they killed left and right. And they did not discriminate anybody from anybody. And everybody uh, uh, tasted, tasted that. Now the US has said, OK, we didn't support them at that time. Now they're coming through democratic elections. And the West is, is as well. They're welcoming them. They're saying, OK, come to rule and let's see what you have. And what happened was the first in Tunisia, the second in Morocco, and now it's in Egypt. And soon it's going to be in Libya. They are coming to power. And before that, they were in Turkey. So you have to let those people come and then let them come to the political arena and like the rest of the world, and they'll be able to bump with each other, not believe as a conspiracy. One dimension mentality. Um, in fact, I think, have we been 45 minutes yet? Or has it been? OK, let's stop here for about 10 minutes, and then we'll continue after that. So the next thing we'll talk about after the conspiracy theory and in the mentality of illusion is one dimension mentality. Can you hear me? OK. A mentality is what you've collected in your mind throughout your life, basically. Everything. Um, all your readings, all your visualizations, all your dialogues, that's how a mentality forms and shapes. One dimension is emphasizing one part of your mentality over the other. And that's when you end up looking like in, a, in a tunnel vision, basically. There are some diseases that cause you, by the way, to see a tunnel vision. If you have the uh, uh, parts of your uh, nervous connections to the eye hit, you will see tunnel vision. You lose all the peripheral vision, so you won't be able to see. So this is a tunnel vision where you're only seeing that part, but there are parts of this world that are outside. So what causes a one-dimension one mentality? A poor environment, lack of dialogue, because then you no longer exchange ideas with the others. Dealing with reality as a monolith, as one simple block. Uh, simplification, half a vision, close-mindedness. We'll go into those in detail. A poor environment can, not always, can lead to a one-dimension mentality if it is not dealt with. Um, a poor environment could be poor naturally. It could be culturally poor. That means only a specific cult, for example, uh, live in an area. And it could have a lack of the methods and means. So that's why if you belong to a cult, more likely than not is that you are going to suffer from uh, one dimension mentality. And a cult is not a major religion, for example. A major religion, there are many ways to think in that major religion. There are different opinions in that major religion. A cult is where you belong to a very small group and that you have to adhere 
to their uh, to their uh, teachings, and you can't go out. That's a cult. And once it becomes bigger and bigger, of course, it can no longer tolerate um, uh, one unique way of thinking. Then it no longer becomes a cult. So part or of the of what a cult means is that it is a low number in the people that believe in it. So that could could fall under poor culture, poor natural environment, for example, Japan does not have any natural environment. It's a, it's a, it's a poor country in terms of uh, uh, where it is. It is not in the center of the world. It doesn't have a uh, vast geography to support it. So they, <laughs> they lack those means, but they were able to overcome them by gain, getting exposed to the world after uh, World War II in the first part of the 20th century. Lack of dialogue. So. In, in order to understand a lack of dialogue, you have to understand what a dialogue is. Dialogue, the word die here means two. Okay, like mono means one, die, try, and so forth. So dialogue, that means there are two people that are dialoguing. One condition of a dialogue is that those two people that are dialoguing, they should have the same weight. So this is not a dialogue. You can't dialogue with anybody. So if somebody calls you to a dialogue, to a hiwar, and they're holding weapons against you, that is not a dialogue. Where, they're, where they, they own the Secret Service and the army and the, uh, all the gangs and thugs, that's not a dialogue. Because at any point in time, if, they dis if you disagree with them, they'll be able to unleash that. So equality is a prerequisite to a meaningful dialogue. Also, shout a log, OK? This happens every Tuesday at 10.05 AM in the Arab world, OK? Mecca time. It's a shout log It's no longer a dialogue. So what is a dialogue? So a dialogue basically is to show the other part, the other party that you're dialoguing with, what they missed. OK, this is their point of view, but let me add to it. Maybe you have another, I have another point of view that I can add to you. That doesn't mean I'm trying to show you what's right and, and wrong. Let me tell you that in the 80s and 90s, when the Gulf states started sending their own students to the US, we went into really like a clash because all what they wanted to do, those students, they wanted to come and what they call dialogue with another person that's not a Muslim and prove to them that I'm right and you're wrong. That's not a dialogue. That's just somebody coming and shoving down someone's throat their own beliefs. That doesn't work. It doesn't work, it's not a dialogue, it's not even a monologue, it's just um, uh, something else. So, that quack is telling him. So you mean the understanding that not everything you dialogue about should be final. So we're not trying to reach the end of a debate where I convince you that this is wrong or you convince me this is right. So dialogue can add something to you. So when you start dialoguing with people, you're not trying to reach a final conclusion. You're just trying to get what they have and add it, if it's, it's addable, to what you believe in or what you think. And this enriches your own environment. Okay. So what are the obstacles to dialogue in our civilization, in our culture? Is that, number one, people think it's a waste of time. And if you dialogue with somebody, you're just submitting to them. Okay. So you should not dialogue with people. Don't talk to people. I even know, you know, when you read a book, that's a form of dialogue because although it's one way, but you're reading what somebody else is telling you and you're trying to open your mind. Some religious sheikhs and some religions, religious ways, they would prevent their followers from reading books that are not verified beforehand. So if you go, if you have a book fair in town, you can't go and buy a book for another scholar because that means you're opening a dialogue and maybe he's going to convince you with something that I didn't convince you with. So that's also part of the obstacle as well. Uh, and it is, uh, the, uh, the, we live also in a culture that uh, uh, prevents dialogue because we just carry the information and keep going on with it. And it's just like I'm handing you the, the information and you take it. So there's no thinking about the information that we are trying to absorb and, and deal with. So the solution to this is number one, holding dialogue sessions, just to sit down and talk. And I don't call those really um, brainstorming. I'm not talking about brainstorming. I'm talking about bringing up an idea, whatever it is, and sitting down 
and discussing it without taking sides. And even moreover, I mean, it could be more uh, fun to do is then switch sides because you're talking about an idea and you're talking about one aspect of it, the other one is talking about, then switch sides and talk about the different sides. So try to defend what your other person, uh, what the other person was trying to, to defend. Um, and this should start at early age, especially with children, is dialoguing with children and talking to them and not just making this come from above. Dealing with reality as a monolithic thing. That means, okay, the West is bad. That's it, the West is evil. That's what it means. It means that my whole impression about the West probably, I'm getting from the local newspaper in town that hates the West and all they spurt out every day, day in, day out, that how bad the West is. This is not true. The, the, the West is a civilization. There is the good, the bad, and the ugly, and the perfect, and everything in it. And the same thing applies here. Now, they look at us the same way. That, in fact, from their way to us is more from our way to them. Our way to them in the 50s, the way we looked at the West in the 50s was that people loved the U.S., they loved the West, everybody wanted to go to the, to, to, to the West and study and live there because the image that was conveyed to us was the image from, coming from Hollywood and the movies and so forth and those who wrote about the West and the freedom and so forth. But our image to them is always the image of the villain. So they always look at us as the evil person who's trying to kill Look at the movies, like those are the second or third class movies where the Arab, they get you an Arab, they all are wearing, uh, all of us, okay? Although not all the Arabs wear this. The Khalijis do, but the non-Khalijis, they don't. So, but in order to make you look an Arab, they have to, to wear this. And then you have to uh, be somebody very evil and you hate everybody and all the words you use are, even in the cartoons. In cartoons, they use that. And uh, in Popeye, the, some of the <laughs> cartoons of Popeye. The, so it is not a monolith. The Muslims are not all bad. There are bad Muslims. I'm saying I'm a Muslim, and I can tell you there are bad Muslims, but not all Muslims are bad. And the same thing in the West. There are bad Westerners, if you want to say, but not all Westerners are bad. And this is normal. In every civilization, there's the good, the bad, and the ugly. So what do we do with the, when we understand that... Um, that the West or the others are not a monolith, we are no longer discouraged. So we, we think is impossible today or tomorrow, might, or impossible today might be possible tomorrow. So we start working on it. So we start working on it to get out of it. Simplification. Also as a one dimension mentality, okay? So, and and that, that, that's natural, by the way. The natural thing is to, is to think and to try to simplify things. Occam's razor says, if there's the, the, the most reasonable explanation for a matter or a problem is the simplest one. So if you find a simpler, so that's the most likely one, that's the solution to that problem. Until you can no longer simplify. Once you simplify beyond whatever you've reached a simplification, becomes superficiality. So you, you end up from tabsit to tasdih. If, you, if, you, if things become superficial, you're not getting the essence of it and you won't be able to understand others. I'll give you a, an example of what are the causes of simplification leading to superficiality. Is Number one, as we said, you look at things from one dimension, you understand only one part of it, and you think this is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth is what you understand. You don't see outside that one dimension mentality. Um, we see that also in the, in the linguistics that, that are used, especially poetry. If you're debating somebody, at a political level, don't use poetry. Poetry, because there are rules for poetry, you've got to use a word that ends with this uh, letter, for example, and you've got to use a certain weight to it. It doesn't help you carry an idea. Uh, again, superficiality, we all tend to uh, try to simplify things. It's just a, a natural things. However, every now and then you get one of your teachers that's totally the opposite. Everything simple has to become very complicated and they won't be able to simplify things uh, for you. So, I'm gonna take you through this. This is just for fun, okay, just, this is how we go into specialty in medicine. You've probably seen this. Medical student, crazy, yes. You look at the attention span. If it's non-existent, they go into emergency medicine. If it's 